Hi, my name is Paul Grogan and in this Gaming Rules video I'm going to be giving you the second part of the How to Play Through the Ages A New Story of Civilization. Now if you haven't watched part one you probably need to go and do that now because otherwise a lot of this stuff won't make any sense. What I'm going to do in this video is rather than continue the run through of turn by turn I'm just going to cover a number of the other rules of the game that I haven't yet covered already. So I hope you enjoy part two. So let's have a look at some situations that might occur. Let's say it's now Green's turn and at the start of Green's turn, obviously after we've done the card row, Green will get to do one political action. They have a political phase and one of the things that they can do is that they can play an aggression card. Now an aggression card you'll see from the top left has a crown on it which means it's played in your political phase and remember you only get to do one political action but it also costs military actions. So often when you're learning the game, you see the, this military action, you think, oh, I can play this on my turn as a military action, which isn't quite true. You have to declare it as your political action and it also costs you a military action, okay? So these are the aggression cards. They're brown in color and they all say aggression. And this is one way in which you can attack another player. Now, the way that it works is you compare strength totals. So in this example right now, green is on five strength and red is on one strength, which is a great time to play an aggression card. Now, there are ways that you can defend yourself against aggressions, and that is dependent upon what cards the red player has got in his hand, okay? Now, what we do is we look at the number of military actions that red has got, and red currently only has two, which means he's allowed to use two cards to defend himself, okay? Now, some cards, these are defense cards. Right now, if he plays this card in defense, it's worth two points of defense. Okay, now, new rule for this edition is any other card, uh, sorry, any other military card that you've got in your hand may also be played in defense for one defense. Okay, so you've got to think, right, green is attacking red, green is on five strength, red is on one strength, so there's a difference of four, and green knows that red has got two military actions and therefore can only play two cards. So what he's doing is he's, he's taking a chance on the fact that red doesn't have two defense cards, which is actually quite a good one because there's only six of these cards in each age. So that would be, you know, a pretty good thing to do for green. Now, if red, for example, had two strength, then he could defend himself because he could use this defense card as two defense and then one other card as the extra one defense. Okay, if he was still on one strength, but he had two of these cards, then again he'd be able to defend himself. So basically, the aggressions, they work if there is enough of a strength difference, okay? If you attack somebody with an aggression and there's only a difference of maybe one or two, then they're probably gonna be able to defend themselves just by, even if they don't have any defense cards, just by discarding other cards, okay? So let's have a look at this aggression and let's see what happens. Now, all the aggressions are slightly different. And basically, it's the player who played the aggression is the attacker, the other player is the defender. If they manage to uh, de play defense cards so that they equal or even exceed your strength, then the attack fails. They don't get anything back, they've just successfully defended themselves. But if, they don't, if they're not able to do that, then the aggression works and you follow through the text on the card. In this case, it says, destroy one of your rivals age A or age one urban buildings. So the urban buildings are the gray ones. When you destroy the building, it doesn't kill the person. So the, per so the building, let's say we decide to destroy this alchemy lab, it goes to the, the worker pool, okay? The building has gone, but the worker is still alive. So then what we would do is it says you would gain uh, resources equal to half its cost rounded up. So in this case, we would gain three resources. So we go one, two, three, okay? And, and that's how the aggressions work. Once the aggression has been played, it goes to the, uh, the military discard pile. And then, uh, yeah, so that's how aggressions work. Since we're talking about attacking people, I'm gonna show you one of the war cards, okay? Now, the wars don't show up until age two, and they are in the age two deck and in the age three deck, okay? And wars are similar to aggressions in that you'll notice there's a crown in the top left, and there is um, some military actions here. This one, War Over Territory, costs, obviously you play it in your political phase and it costs you two military actions, okay? So they are declared in the same way as aggressions. However, 
there are some very key differences. The first difference is that they're not resolved immediately. Okay, what happens is you play them, you've then got the whole of your turn, then the, the next player has got the whole of their turn, and then at start of your following turn, the war is resolved. Okay, so if this was a four player game and green was to attack red, then green would play it on, the, on their turn, then green would take the rest of their turn, the other players would take their turn, red would take their turn, and then at the start of green's next turn, that's when the war is resolved, okay? So there, there is a delay from when you play them to when it gets resolved. The second difference with war cards that I'm gonna mention is that you can't play the defense cards, or in fact, you can't discard any other cards to boost your strength. And the reason for that is in a war, there is no attacker and defender. Both sides are attacking each other. So there isn't actually any one defender and therefore you can't play defense cards, which means the result of the war is purely determined by the strength values here. But remember, when you declare the war, it isn't gonna be resolved until the start of your next turn. So I've seen games played where, let's say green had 10 strength and red had, say, six, and green thought, oh yeah, I'll, I'll be all right, I'll, I'll declare war on red. Green then spends his turn, and then on red's turn, red plays uh, a, you know, a combination of cards and manages, manages to do certain things and ends up with more strength than green. Now this is really bad for green because what happens is at the start of green's turn, the war is resolved and the red player wins the war. So the way that the wars work is it says the victor gains this bonus and that could actually be either side. So when you're declaring war on somebody, you've got to be very careful, keep an eye on what they've been picking up and keep an eye on what they're doing to try and make sure that they don't end up with more strength than you at the start of your next turn, which is when the war is resolved. So the next thing I'm gonna cover is changing your government, okay? Now you'll notice from the card row that some of the cards on here are orange, which are the same color as your existing government. So this one is monarchy, okay? Uh, now you take the card as normal from the card row, paying the civil actions, but to play it, there are two different ways to play it, as you'll see from the cost here. The first way of playing it is as normal. It costs you one civil action, you spend the science cost, you put it into play straight away, okay? Now Monarchy has got five civil actions and three military actions. So if you play it when you're currently in despotism, let's say this is the situation, so you spend maybe two actions to take the card, then you spend one action to play the card, okay? Straight away, you gain that civil action and that military action. So what we do is we take an extra white and a red cube and we put them on there, okay? So the extra actions that you get from this card are available immediately, okay? So that's one way to change a government is by paying the normal science cost. Let's just put these back here. The other way to do it is to have a revolution. Now, terminology is important here. This is a revolution, not an uprising. Remember, we covered uprisings earlier. That's when you don't have enough happiness and you skip your production. In a revolution, it's very simple. It costs you all of your civil actions but it costs you a lower amount of science. And it must be the first civil action that you do in the turn. So you can't just use your other civil actions and then say, right, okay, I'll now use all of the ones I've got left to do the revolution. It has to be the first thing that you do to declare a revolution. But you do get it for a lower cost, okay? While we're talking about governments, I'm gonna mention the urban building limit because I did mention in the first video that there's no limit to how many mines or farms or military units you have but there is a limit to the number of cubes that you have on the gray cards. So there isn't a limit to the number of cards, there's a limit to the number of cubes you have on those cards, okay? And that limit is the urban building limit, which is shown in the bottom right of the government card. And it starts off at two when you start the game with despotism, but uh, as you can see from monarchy, that's gone up to three, and some of the later governments have four. Now, the urban building limit is another thing which catches people out when they're learning how to play. So I'm gonna try and explain it to you here in, in, in the words that I use when I'm teaching people how to play. We mentioned earlier on that each of these uh, gray things here has a type, okay? So this philosophy here is a lab. And this alchemy that I've just stolen from the red player, um, this is a lab as well. So it goes here, okay? The urban building limit uh, apply, it gives you, you can build a maximum number of buildings of each type, 
equal to this. So if we've got monarchy, our urban building limit is three. That means we can have three labs in total. Doesn't matter whether they're here or here or a mixture of the two, we're allowed to have three. So for example, that's okay. We've got three. If we move that to there, that's okay. We've got three. It doesn't mean we can have three of them and three of them. That, that's not allowed. It's three labs in total. Okay, so that's the, that's the urban building limit. Uh, and that's, that's how government cards work. So yes, um, I mean, this government is a fairly simple one. It just gives you extra white and red cubes, but some of the other governments give you other bonuses, including military strengths and other things. So military hand size now, which is something that I haven't mentioned yet. I have mentioned the civil hand size. So I've mentioned that the number of civil cards that you're allowed in your hand is equal to the number of civil actions that you've got. And you're never allowed to exceed that. You're never allowed to take a card from the card row that would mean that you have more cards than you're allowed. The military cards work in a slightly different way. You do have a military hand size, which is based on the number of military actions that you've got, but you are allowed to exceed it. Now, the way it works, as you may have noticed from the end of turn sequence, so your end of turn sequence is what happens at the end of your turn. And at the start of that sequence, you discard excess military cards. So let's say it was red player's turn and red, red has just done his turn. He's now doing his end of turn sequence. He's got three cards, three military cards, and he's only allowed two of them. So what, what he would do is he would choose one of the cards and say, right, I don't want that one. I'll keep two, which is my limit. But then after his production phase, he draws military cards. So he's got two unused actions. So he would draw two more cards, okay? So he's actually exceeded his hand limit, but that's okay because it's now no longer his turn. Basically, you can keep more of these cards in hand when it's, when it's not your turn, and in fact, until the end of your next turn. So yes, so at the start of your end of turn sequence, that is the point when you check your hand limit, discard any excess that you've got, and then draw new ones. So one other thing that I didn't mention in part one of the video was about taking additional wonders. So if this was the setup here, we have an additional wonder here and green has already finished the Colossus. So he can take this wonder here, but it will cost him one extra civil action. And that's because he's got one completed wonder. So you can take extra wonders when you've finished the first one, but it costs you one extra action for each wonder that you currently have. Red, however, is still building, building the pyramids. He hasn't, he decided he was gonna build them and he's not finished them yet. And you're only allowed to have one wonder under construction at any time. So red, at the moment, is not allowed to take another wonder until this has either been finished or it's been discarded because of the end of age effect. Speaking of end of age effects, this is another thing that sometimes catches people out when they're learning. So there, there is something that happens at the end of each age, except for age A. Okay, so we already covered the end of AJ, which happened at the end of the first round of the turn, once both players had had one turn. But when this deck of cards, so this deck of cards is on here, this represents age one. When this deck runs out, and there we go, we have the end of age one, okay? And certain things happen. Once you've done that, age two starts. At the end of age two, you do the end of age two effects. And then age three comes in, and again, you do it at the end of age three. So there is an end of age step, which happens at the end of ages one, two, and three. Uh, and what happens is that certain things will get removed. So first of all, cards in hand. If at the end of age one, if you have any cards in your hand from age A will disappear. You remove them from your hand. At the end of age two, you will lose any cards in your hand from age one. And at the end of age three, you will lose cards in your hand from age two, okay? The next thing that happens is leaders will go. So a leader, so Hammurabi, for example, he's an age A leader. He lives for age A and for age one. At the end of age one, he goes, okay? So he's died. And wonders, wonders, if you've built them, they last forever. But if you haven't built them, if, you're st if they're still under construction, then they will go at the end of the age. Again, not at the end of the age of the wonder, but the end of the next age. So these pyramids, they are an age A wonder. If you haven't finished them by the end of age one, then the card is discarded. And also pacts. 
So any packs that you've got in your, uh, that are in play uh, from, again, the previous age, they will go. And finally, at the end of ages one, two, and three, all players will lose two yellow cubes from their yellow bank, okay? So just when you thought the game was, was going okay, suddenly you've lost two yellow cubes. So that's what happens, as I say, at the end of ages uh, one, two, and three, is that you follow through these steps, and then you put the next deck of cards on there like so. Now I haven't mentioned Pacts yet. Pacts are the blue cards, they are in the military deck, and they are played, well, you propose a pact as your, uh, during your politics phase, as your political action, okay? Now, pacts are not used in a two-player game. So in this game, with these player setups, we would have removed these pact cards from the game before we started playing, okay? But you use them with three or four players. To propose a pact, so again, it, yeah, it's done in your politics phase, and what you do is you say, I'm gonna propose this international trade agreement between me and you. Now you're not allowed to discuss it with the other player before it actually happens. Before you propose it, you're not allowed to talk about it beforehand. You've just got to propose it as your political action and they either accept it or they don't accept it. If they don't accept it, then the card goes back into your hand. That's your political action done, but you could then propose it on the next turn to either the same player or a different player. Um, but if it is accepted, what you do is you put it on the table between the two players. So if we were playing with three or four players and green proposed this pact with red, if red accepted, the pact would be placed here between the two players. If green proposed it with the player over here, he'd put it there so it was between the two players, okay? The pact affects the players uh, depending on what's on them. This pact has a different effect for who's A and who's B. So when you propose the pact, you would say, okay, I'm proposing this pact with you and I'm gonna be B and you're gonna be A, for example. And if they agree with it, you would put it like that so that B is pointing to you and A is pointing to them. Okay, now, pacts will stay in play uh, until they are canceled for one of a number of reasons. First of all, either player involved in the pact can cancel it as their, uh, during their politics phase as their political action. Because sometimes you will have a pact in play and it ends up backfiring and the other player's getting so much of an advantage from it that you actually want to cancel it. Um, certainly not this one, but some of the other ones are. The other way to cancel a pact is if you propose a different one. So let's say the green player has this pact with the blue player, then on a few turns later, green decides, oh, hang on a minute, I actually want to play this pact with red. So what he would do is he would propose it as his, during his politics phase, if it's rejected, it just goes back into his hand and this one stays in play. But if the red player accepts this new pact, it would go there and this one would be cancelled because each player can only have one pact that they proposed that's, that's currently in play. Now, that's not to say that they can't have more than one pact. So if green had this one with the blue player and then it was red that proposed this pact with green, that's okay. So that one was started by green and going to blue. This one was started by red and going to green. That's perfectly okay. But one player can't have two packs that they proposed with other, with other people, or in fact, with the same person. Um, so that's how packs work. Again, you only use them in multiplayer games. And yeah, they will, they will last for their age and the next age like most of the other cards and the leaders, and then they'll disappear at the end of the age after that. So this card here is an age two pact. This will last for the whole of age two uh, and the whole of age three. And if it isn't canceled, it will disappear at the end of age three. I just wanna cover one more thing about tactics card. You'll notice during the game that um, the tactics cards have actually got two numbers on. Now, what happens is that you will, you need to have the units that make up this army have to be of this age or the one before for you to get the higher number. So in this example here, we've got these two cavalrymen, which are age two, so they're okay. But these two warriors down here, these are age A. So they're not from this age and they're not from the one before. They're actually from one, two before this one, which means we get the lower number. In order to get the higher number, we would have to play, say, for example, we'd have to have the swordsman. If we had the swordsman and we had this guy up here, then this is an age one infantryman. So he will contribute to this properly and we'll get the five. So this is how the tactics cards work. Just a reminder, these units, 
that make up this tactics card have to be from this age or the one before, or in fact the one afterwards, for you to get the higher number. If you use any units to make up this army that are two ages older than this, you get the lower number. One of the types of event cards that players can place into the events area is a territory. Okay, so I'm just going to show you an example here. If, if one player decides to put a card here, remember every time you put a card here, you reveal this card and we've revealed this one. Now this is a territory. So you don't simply just follow the instructions on it. What happens is this new territory has been discovered somewhere in the world and the players actually bid against each other for who gets to colonize this territory. So when this card gets revealed, what we do is we start a bidding. The, the bidding starts with the player who revealed the card. So in this case, let's say it was green and the card got revealed. And what you're doing is you're actually bidding with strength points of your military units, plus any bonuses. Now, you can't win the bid purely with bonuses, okay? At least one person, at least one military unit has to go to the new territory to plant the flag. So let's say this card got revealed on green's turn. Now, green has the Colossus, which gets one bonus when colonizing. So what Green's going to do is he's going to bid two, okay? He doesn't have to specify where that two's coming from, he just says two. But what we're thinking about is we could sacrifice this one guy here that's one strength and we get the one point of colonization bonus, okay? So Green is going to bid two. Now looking at Red, Red has two warriors, okay? Which means if it was only warrior, if it was only on military strength, he could also bid two and you've got to bid higher than the previous person. Now, if we look at this card earlier, this is the defense card that we saw earlier on. You'll notice that there's actually two uses. The top part is defense and the bottom part is used when colonizing. So what blue, what red could do is he could bid three. Okay. Now, if he wins with that bid, he's going to have to sacrifice these two and play the card. So green is probably thinking, oh, okay, he's bid three. Now, does green want to bid four? Let's have a look. Green doesn't have any of the colonization bonuses card. So if green was to bid four, he'd have to bid this one, which is two plus the one, plus his colonization bonus. Okay, so I'm not sure whether he would want to bid the four. So I'm gonna explain now how tactics cards work with bidding for colonies. So uh, earlier on, Green had the fighting band, which means if he's got these two guys here, they group together and they get one strength. So actually Green's strength is two for this guy, one for this guy, and one because he's got this. So his strength is actually four, okay? Uh, what's red strength at the moment? Red strength is only two. Right, now, so if Green was to uh, bid just this guy, that would be two strength. If he was to bid this guy, it would be just one. If he bids them both together, it would be four because if, if you are bidding and you actually sacrifice the whole army, you get the tactics bonus of the army, okay? So Green's, in this situation, Green's maximum bid is actually five because his, his military units are four and his Colossus is one. Remember, when you're bidding, you just say the number. You don't actually have to say what it is you're bidding. So the other player doesn't know what you've got because you might have defense, uh, you might have the colonization cards in hand. So in this example, uh, green bid two, red decided to bid three, green doesn't want to sacrifice all of his armies, so he passes, which means red gets the territory. Red has to um, meet that bid of three, which is these two guys and this one colonization card. Now, these two guys are sacrificed, which means they actually go back to the yellow bank. They don't go to the worker pool, they're actually gone gone and back down here, back on the yellow bank. Now the yellow bank, although there is only space for this many, any extra ones that you get, just sit in this area here and you can buy them for two food, just like, just like these two. Okay, now what that means is that um, Red has now got this territory and on the territory there are two pieces of information on it. There is the permanent ability at the bottom, so in this case what would happen is Red would get three more yellow cubes, but he would lose one blue cube, okay? Because this territory is vast and it, it requires uh, more, more maintenance. Um, but he also gains a one-off bonus of three food. So this is a one-off bonus, this is permanent. So he gets these three cubes and he actually takes them from the game box. Oh my God, look at all this. He's got lots and lots of potential new people. 
and he gains three food. So one, two, three. Okay, so that's that's how the territories work. They're, they're bid for. You win them by sacrificing your military units with any bonuses that you've got. Uh, when you get them, you get the bonus that's on there, and then you put the card next to your board, and that is your territory. Just going to mention something else about leaders, which I haven't mentioned earlier on. So what I did mention earlier on is the fact that each leader comes from a particular age. So Hammurabi is from the age of antiquity. And you're not allowed to take two leaders from the same age. So even if you took Hammurabi into your hand and then you decided, oh, well, I, I don't want this guy, I want to take a different one. You're not allowed to. Um, now, once it's in play, this leader has an effect on you until he dies. Um, which will be for Hammurabi at the end of age one. So a leader lasts for their age and the age afterwards. Now you can replace your leader with one from a later age. So let's say you've drawn Genghis Khan. What you can do on your turn is you can spend one civil action to replace your leader. And what happens is Hammurabi goes and is replaced by Genghis Khan. Now there is a change to the rules for this edition in the fact that if you do that, if you replace a leader, you actually get the civil action back. So it costs you one civil action to do that, but you get that action back. So it is, it is easier in this version of the game to replace your leader. Again, once you've got uh, Genghis Khan, you could then replace him with another leader from uh, age two. You don't need to, because remember, the leader will last for their age and the one afterwards. So Genghis Khan will last for the whole of age one and for the whole of age two, but he will die at the end of age two. Another thing I want to talk about are the different types of urban buildings. So you start the game with labs and temples. And we, may, we saw earlier on that if you have the alchemy card, this is a lab. So if you were to develop this technology, it would go here because it matches this one. This is a lab as well, so it goes there. But there are other types of urban buildings in the game. For example, the printing press. This is a library. So what would happen is if you were to develop this technology, it doesn't go over either of these, it goes here, okay? Because it's a different type of technology. Some people might want to put it there because this is technology from age one. There are also theatres and arenas as well. So there's actually five different types of urban buildings in total. So that's the end of the video. As I mentioned right at the start of part one, this isn't the normal kind of video that I do. This was completely unscripted and it was done with a sense of urgency as I needed to get the video out there as soon as possible. But hopefully with part one and part two, you've got a good handle on how you play the game. And obviously the full rules are in the rule book included in the game in case there's anything else that I didn't cover. If you've got any questions, feel free to drop me an email or a geek mail or however else you want to get hold of me. So that's all. Take care and thanks for watching.